There we go. Shalom Aleichem and welcome everybody to our uh, meeting where we are discussing Hebrew pedagogy and Hebrew life with different uh, Hebrew scholars. And today I'm joined by Dr. Kevin Chin. Um, Kevin was at Union University whenever I was finishing up my MA, you were coming in. Um, and so tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are now, because that's pretty interesting. Sure. Thanks, Mario, first of all, for having me on. It's uh, fun to be on your, I guess, show or channel and uh, to talk about Hebrew together, something that I love to do. And <clears throat> it's especially fun to do it with um, with somebody else who's also right in the thick of it, <clears throat> um, yeah. whether learning on your own or teaching and stuff. So um, where I am and uh, where I've been, well, yes, uh, I was at Union for nine years. Uh, I was teaching there in um, the School of Theology and missions um from 2010 to 2019 mm -hmm. and um after that uh i joined my current institution uh which is called christian witness theological seminary in san jose california so this is actually where i'm from um san jose california uh, but this is a, a chinese mandarin speaking seminary so there's a, a whole host of uh, other things um that I've learned uh, and that relate to teaching Hebrew in English versus in Chinese. Um, does your mother, uh, wait, sorry, I apologize. Uh, your grandmother, if, you're, if your family's like mine, does your grandmother judge your Mandarin? Mm, yeah, my grandparents are not around. And, oh, okay, you're lucky um, then. <laughs> they they um, uh, were always in Taiwan. So uh, my parents were the ones that moved here. Uh, and so I don't think I was around them enough to be judged. Yeah. I, but I, I do get judged sometimes by others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or or you might get judged by some uh, uh, matriarch of the community, I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah. An elder. An elder in the community. Yeah. I find that whenever I teach in Spanish or other languages, right? Uh, inevitably, some elder at the church or in the Sunday school classroom that I'm filling in or something like that comes up and goes, why did you say it that way? This is how we actually say it. <laughs> yes, like, this is ah, to me. It still does. Forgive me. Okay. <laughs> so um, you're there now. Are y'all officially a denominationally affiliated or is it kind of an interdenominational <laughs> thing? Yeah, we are. Um, we're an evangelical seminary. Okay. Um, we're interdenominational. Cool. Um, yeah, so we serve. Yeah, I mean, we serve uh chinese churches in america especially but uh, mostly uh here in northern california in the bay area okay and the churches here largely are um uh non-denominational mm -hmm. evangelical and so it sort of fits our our context yeah yeah um i've got several cousins out in the san jose area so i i understand that quite well well let's talk about hebrew rather than embarrassing ourselves about our second or third language that we also speak. Um, so what, what was your initial uh, exposure to Hebrew? And then who taught you whenever you were learning Hebrew? Yeah, um, my initial exposure to Hebrew was as an MDiv student. Um, I was an MDiv student at Western Seminary's uh, San Jose campus. Oh. And I was a part-time student. Um, and actually one of the, um, most exciting things to me about going to seminary in the first place was to, uh, learn biblical languages. Hmm. And I think, I, th I think for whatever reason I started with Hebrew, hmm. I don't think that, um, before I'd taken either Hebrew, Hebrew or Greek that I preferred one or the other, but I, I took Hebrew as one of my first classes, mm -hmm. um, as an MDiv student at Western. Um, the, the professors that I had were the professors that were um, at, that, at the school at the time. And um, so one was Dr. Roy Lowe, another was Dr. David Ekman. And mm. uh, I've been blessed to uh, keep in touch with them um, mm. at different degrees uh, over, over the years and yeah. even seen both of them recently. So that was fun. Yeah. Um... Okay, so you go into seminary and you're taking Hebrew early on, and uh, we we discussed this offline. But you grew up speaking some Mandarin at least. Did 
that kind of attract you to Hebrew because it, it's not, you know, one of the, okay, let me back up a split second. One of the reasons why a lot of people that I've talked to don't want to touch Hebrew is because Hebrew doesn't have any letter system that looks like ours. And I, I've wondered, and I've never interviewed anybody that, that did an Asian base language, but I wondered if knowing caricature type language made it less daunting to consider Hebrew versus Greek and English. Yeah, I think for me at that time, it probably wasn't a really big factor because oh. uh, when I started my MDiv studies, my Mandarin was very, very poor. Oh. And I um, I don't think I cared. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at least consciously, it did not um, affect uh, uh, my uh, choice of taking okay. Hebrew. Um, but I mean, maybe to get at your question, uh, I think I think I kind of like languages anyway. Mm. Um, so I think, and then I also, and then on top of that, it's not that I had learned a lot at that point, but mm -hmm. I had taken some Spanish in high school mm -hmm. and then I had the chance to use it on a couple of like mm -hmm. church trips. And I thought that was really cool. And, yeah. um, and then when it came to studying scripture, it was, to me, it was um, very natural, you know, like I wanted mm -hmm. to, um, go to another level that is go into greater depth um, and being able to study the text. And so this was a big reason for me to uh, go to seminary. Sure. Yeah. Um, so whenever you come to Hebrew, uh, what in early on in your MDiv, what did you find was the hardest thing for you to grasp in regards to biblical Hebrew? Yeah, there's, um, there's a few, and I think they're the same ones that my, <laughs> I've seen my students struggle with. Oh, good. Um, but yeah, the, the forms of the words, uh, change, um, a lot. So, uh, the most, um, obvious example of that would be a weak verb. So that's yeah. really hard and it still can be, um, mm -hmm. especially when you're learning it for the first time. So that, sure. um, that was hard. And then of course, it's not just verbs, um, you know, uh, suffixes or prefixes, they, they change the forms of nouns and other parts mm -hmm. of speech and it can be a lot to keep track of things can look really similar mm -hmm. uh, visually some letters look similar and then you know they some of some words sound similar so <laughs> you know it it's it's not easy in the beginning mm. yeah um i mean for instance malak and malek you know um rain and king you know they 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 look similar but they definitely uh, nouns versus verbs, right? Because every noun is a verb and every verb also has a, a cognate noun equivalent. So yeah, I'm I just thinking back to that. I definitely remember the same struggles as well. Um, I tend to wonder, do you think the visual struggle, as you worded it, uh, for instance, with um, weak verbs, do you think the visual struggle <clears throat> is because people are sight reading versus reading out loud vocally? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think if um, they were also to read out vocally, I think that would help. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think the more you throw at it, uh, the more ways you use to look at it. Yeah. It gives you a better chance of making distinctions. Sure. One of the things that we have in our textbook and that I use in my classroom all the time is that your eyes will lie, but your ears will hear. Mm -hmm. um, because whenever you look at Hebrew being a synthetic language, it wants to magnetize stuff to it. You look at it and you get overwhelmed because now all of a sudden you have this word that's, I don't know, seven, eight, nine letters long. And you're like, wait a second, I thought verbs were three. <laughs> um, but whenever you read it out loud, slowly, you can hear better than you can see. And that was huge for me, um, in learning Hebrew. And I've seen with my students that it's huge for them to hear it as they read it because it is very daunting whenever you just stare at it. So I wonder if that was a thing, and I didn't know if you knew any kind of um, connectivity to that, so. Yeah, I like what you're doing, and there's, um, yeah, I think I think that's a good way. Yeah. Um, even for me, having taught Hebrew for a little bit of time, I mean, I'm always looking at better ways, more effective ways for my students sure. Sure. Um, to learn the language, so I think that's a a good, a good uh, pointer. Okay. So Hebrew is definitely bemoaned 
in normal English seminaries? Is it bemoaned in a Mandarin seminary? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Why do you, would you say? I, I have a lot of people answering the question for English seminary. So let's 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 answer for Mandarin seminary. Um I think the the basic reasons are similar. Um, one being what whichever context you're talking about is that learning language is um, is hard and it and it takes time. And to a Mandarin speaker, um, especially here since our school is in the states, mm-hmm. they still um, have more familiarity with um, they still have some familiarity with English, which then makes the grammar and some of the vocabulary for Greek a little more familiar than Hebrew. Mm-hmm. So yeah. then when you compare the two, Greek or Hebrew, yeah, they feel like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, a question then, because this is another thing we do in our textbook, is that we connect the vocabulary to names that are already in the text or to um, modern Hebrew, modern Arabic type of words, things of that sort. In Chinese, or specifically Mandarin we're speaking of, do the proper biblical names sound like the Hebrew equivalents or are they very far afield? Um, uh, Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yes, I understand the question. Uh-huh. Um, it's a hard one to answer. So I have to compare it to English, I guess. Okay. Uh, so I think compared to English, like Abram, Abraham, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. This is just my subjective feeling. I still feel like it's a little bit further off. Okay. Um, and I guess that would have to be because the sounds that you make in English hmm. are still more closely mapped to Hebrew than the sounds you make in Chinese mm. to Hebrew, I think. Yeah. Well, the first time I ever thought of this question. <laughs> so, no, but, it's... Yeah. Because whenever I think about uh, vocabulary, and this is one of the things that Dr. Griffin, who's the, he was really the architect of this style of grammar, um, he struggled desperately to learn the vocab, and he, in his doctorate work, and then he went and did stuff in Jerusalem, um, figured out vocabulary via connecting each word to a proper name. Of course, the easy ones that we can think of off the top of our head, you know, um, um, uh, Bethlehem, you know, uh, uh, Yerushalayim, etc. You can cut those apart and learn other words. And in French, we call those pourmento. Um, I didn't know if there was a one-for-one correspondence or a close correlation in Mandarin with those formal words that you could then help teach your students the Hebrew words by saying, hey, you remember like Yeremia, right? Um, or whatever the uh, name that you're considering at that point in time. But if they're far afield, that may not help. Yeah, I'm not sure if that... What, what's, a, what's, a, what's an English example where you would use that? Um, I can't an English think of e- example? Yeah. So, so uh, 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 for instance, in whenever we talk about your rod to go down, we connect that directly with your done. The Jordan River goes down. Um, right. And so those are one for one correspondence. Uh, um, Qumran, Qum is to stand and arise. Well, so is a mod, but Qum is to, to go up. And so Qumran, and we know Qumran because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a lot of those types of words that we connect in that way. Aliyah or al, we connect yeah. that to a modern Hebrew word, aliyah, making aliyah, which is to go up and return, right? right? Um, yada, to know, we connect that with, for instance, uh, Master Yoda, he mm-hmm. knows everything. So I didn't know if there was um, words as such that you can utilize in Mandarin to help people connect the Hebrew words to, because I agree if you know any kind of English, as probably your students do, Greek may seem easier, vocabularily speaking. But what we often say is, if you know the story of the Bible and the characters in the Bible, you know a lot more Hebrew than you realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's not quite as smooth, Mm. uh, not quite as easy to find those kinds of parallels. Um, I mean, I think something that comes close, um, 
could be teaching them the meaning of the names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because they that that can you know that can be some vocabulary mixed in with you know a name that they're already really familiar yeah. with. Yeah. So um, are for instance, are the prophets' names in the Mandarin Bible akin to the prophetic names that we have in the English Bible? Jeremiah, Zechariah, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that you can, you know, hug eyes to hug or embrace, right? Um, or to rejoice. And so you that might be something to consider of using those names to help you teach the vocabulary. Um I don't know. That'd be a really fun study to see how different a field the Mandarin equivalents are. Yeah, it depends so, on the name. <laughs> if it were Isaiah, it mm -hmm. would be kind of close because, yeah, I mean, if you want to use it to help someone remember um, the verb to say, a uh, save, mm -hmm. um, yasha, mm -hmm. that's kind of close to the way Isaiah's name is pronounced in Chinese. Oh, so it's not Ishia. It's Yashia in Mandarin. It, it's a uh, it's it's neither of those, but oh. it's still kind of close to Yasha. <laughs> wow, this is really interesting. Um, okay, so next question because this is going along with it. So so we're seeing that there's a struggle for your Mandarin students to grasp the the vocab in comparison to the Greek. Um, what is the retention rate? If, if I don't know how long you've been teaching with the Mandarin students to say that. You kind of have a thumb on the retention rate, but um, uh, Dr. Carl Sanders Jr. talked about that there's only a 10% retention rate of English speaking students in America. What does Mandarin speaking Hebrew students look like? It's pretty low. I mean, we haven't done mm. a study like that and I haven't seen it, but I would expect that it's probably about the same. Okay. Um, yeah. Do they, are they taking Hebrew from you at the seminary? Um, for lack of better terms, just to punch punch a class out of their uh, requirements, or are some of them taking it and then continuing uh, to use Hebrew hermeneutically speaking, whenever they go into the pastorate or go into ministry, whatever? Yeah, I mean, this also relates to the kinds of degree offerings and requirements that mm -hmm. those offerings have. Mm -hmm. um, most of our students are in a two-year uh, Master of Christian Ministries uh, okay. program here. And um, that program doesn't require them to take um, a lot of biblical languages. Right. So they take um, a functional Greek and Hebrew class, and they're not required to take anything, any other biblical languages. So, so, so one? Yes. So not, not two semesters, it's just one semester course? That's right. Wow. That's right. So for them, mm -hmm. um, I, I would guess that they come at it thinking, okay, well, I'm going to learn a little bit of Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and only if I really want to, um, then I will use my elective credit hours to take probably either Greek or Hebrew. Um, it'd be doubtful that they do both. If it were a uh, master of biblical studies student or an MDiv student, which again is a minority um, of our student body, then they'd be required to take more. And from this pool of students, uh, there would be more that would want to um, keep it up and use it in their study of scripture and in their ministries. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine last week, um, interviewing him. He's an African-American uh, professor of Hebrew, which is rare. Um, and he and I were discussing why is it that so few African-Americans go into Hebrew studies? I, I want to pose sort of kind of the same question in regards to Asians. And I think you somewhat have answered that in regards to um, familiarity with English helps them to woos them more into the Greek. Um, but why do we see more Asians doing Greek study than Hebrew studies? Because you go to ETS or SBL like I do, man, there's a lot more Asians doing Greek than Hebrew. I don't know the answer to that question. And mm. um, yeah, and even for me, my, this isn't exactly what you asked, but um, the, the way that I would, um, the way I even have interest in biblical languages, it's, mm. it's 
different um, because I grew up in the States mm -hmm. compared to um, a lot of my students who grew up overseas. Mm -hmm. And so for them, uh, or a good portion of them, um, they've had a lot of past experience trying to learn English. Mm. And I don't know, this is kind of a guess from me, mm -hmm. but I feel like they've had bad experiences trying to learn English already. So then the next step is, well, maybe I don't even want to bother learning any foreign language because it's impossible. Wow. Yeah. So because I already spent uh, years learning English, they taught it to us in school all this time. Right. And I'm still like this right now. Mm -hmm. Um. And so there's, there is like the emotional side to it. And so hmm. maybe you've seen this too. Like, I feel like in, when you teach Hebrew, uh, you really got to encourage your students. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, try to help them to believe. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of our students and, and you might reflect on your time at union, but a lot of our students in the undergrad come to us having done, like you said, high school, French, high school, Spanish, whatever, and feel that they can't learn a language because they didn't learn high school French or, or Spanish, whatever the case is. And then they show up to your Hebrew one class and you're like, and they, they're right out of their mouth. They go, I can't learn a language. Well, you're speaking a language right now. So clearly you can learn a language. We just have to figure out which mode uh, best works for you. Um, so yeah, no, I, I completely agree. That's, that's really sad that maybe poor prior language exposure leads to poor biblical language learning. I've never correlated the two, but that's a good thought. I'll have to think on it. So for you, when you were learning Hebrew, what was your light bulb moment? Or was there multiple light bulb moments? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's probably more than one. Mm. Um, and I think when, I think at first, when you start learning the vocabulary and you can pronounce a word, <laughs> that's already, that's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And that's already a big step. Um mm -hmm to be able to recognize and pronounce a word, mm. um, even, even its lexical form mm -hmm. and start to think, okay, wow, I can actually, I can read this. I may not know what it means, but I can, I can pronounce it and read it out. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I would say, this kind of goes back to an earlier question that you mm -hmm. asked about who I learned from. Um, when I was in my doctoral studies, I kept studying Hebrew and I, um, you know, I got to learn from Dr. Salehammer. So um, my first exposure to him was when he was uh, um, still at Southeastern, but teaching okay. summer courses, which included some courses at Western in the summer. Mm. And he walks into class and he's um, teaching class from a Hebrew Bible. And I was like, whoa, that is crazy. And um, it yeah. just opened my eyes to a uh, just a whole other level and a possibility. Mm of uh, at least for him at the um uh, what what a what a person can do um, yeah with... my uh my torah students uh this fall are reading cell hammer um so my master's torah students are reading meaning of the pentateuch and i love cell hammer and what he does with that so yeah i i definitely i didn't ever study under dr cell hammer but uh i think most of us Old Testament evangelicals are are somewhat uh, uh, indebted to Dr. Selhammer. Um, and so that's awesome that you got to study under him. I, I remember something similar. I went into a course. Um, it was while I was doing my doctorate. <clears throat> I had to go sit in on a class that was Hebrew. Um, apologies. It was an Old Testament uh, interpretation course. And uh, it was my major professor teaching at Dr. Archie England. And, um, and so I sit, I'm sitting in the back, just observing, learning how to teach and be a PhD, et cetera. And, uh, this one master student says, well, raises his hand. He goes, Dr. England, I, my Bible doesn't say that. And I was like, oh no. And, uh, and Dr. England says, well, why don't you, why don't you come forward and, and check out my Bible and, and let's compare them. And the guy walks all the way forward and he goes, you're reading Hebrew. <laughs> and Dr. England goes, Yes, I'm sight translating. So if you disagree, get your degree, read your Hebrew and come back and talk to me. <laughs> so I love whenever our professors do that type of a thing. I'm not there yet. Do you teach from the Hebrew Bible uh, sight translating? I, I, I do not perfectly, but I do. And it was because Dr. Silhammer told me to do it. Wow. I was terrified. 
at first yeah. because there's always stuff you don't know. Then I realized that it's okay. Just ask the students what their Bible says. <laughs> nice. So do you, is this only in Hebrew course or is this also in like an Old Testament book course or an Old Testament survey that you also sight read from your Hebrew? I just always, it's already a habit for me, mm. um, including the not knowing some words or mistranslating some stuff. Mm. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I really, I read Hebrew in every class. Um, typically I will read the verse of the day from the lexicon or, uh, um, uh, common book of common prayers, what I should say, not the lexicon, um, the liturgical calendar. Um, but I don't sight read Hebrew all the time like that. I, I really, I want to get to that point. I envy you. You can try. I envy you're, never, you're never going to feel ready. You just Man, try. And I, then, I um, really don't feel ready. Okay. <laughs> just do it. You say dive in, huh? Yeah, that that's, that's what I did. I, I yeah, I was yeah. terrified. Okay. So especially when I have to read a passage. Yeah. Like, oh, great. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this. Do you, um, the day of before your lecture where, you know, you're going to be reading, I don't know, let's just say Genesis 15. Um, do you, pre-read Genesis 15 that way uh, you, you've read it that morning or something or is it no. on the spot um I mean I, I'm I would look over of course I would look over the passages you know that I'm going to teach from right. um and yeah if there's like a really hard part that I can't make sense of then I'll, I'll look up some words hmm. but um yeah no I don't I don't do it yeah, I, I don't, I don't do any special, anything special other than preparing for class, I think. Okay. Um, when you're doing this sight reading in class, are you using a BHS or are you using a reader or what do you use? Yeah, I just, I use BHS. Okay. Yeah. I could see myself using the reader that I prescribed to my Hebrew students, which is the crossway reader. Yeah, that um, works too. Yeah, then, uh, then you don't have to ask them. You can just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those random, what in the world is that? It, Solomon, what are you doing? That's only <laughs> the only time Solomon ever uses that one word. Um, and I guess it would also depend upon which text we're talking about because narrative is easier than wisdom. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So it's it's funny. Our, our president, Dr. Heath Thomas, is a wisdom scholar. Um, and he and I chuckle all the time that uh, there's some passages that uh, I, I have to read it with a dictionary very close at hand because almost oh, yeah. every other word is one of those one-time use words and you're like I don't know what this is <laughs> yeah yeah I, I'd be in trouble you know in in, in some wisdom books and some other yeah. portions of the Old Testament definitely okay so in regards to Hebrew, you've taught Hebrew uh, at Union in, in English and you're teaching Hebrew now in Mandarin what do you think is the future of Hebrew studies? Just as a teacher of uh, Hebrew, what do you, what do you hope it is? If you want to go that way, man, I wish I knew. Um, for me, um, I'm interested in the creative ways of hmm. teaching that you and others are um, putting out there. Yeah. Or more, more in recent years. So I think that that's, exciting and i think it's worth trying so i'm going to try it <laughs> i try more Love of it, it. yeah um this fall um so mm -hmm. um yeah i mean given my context and also things i'm hearing about um uh, american evangelical seminaries it it sounds like you know we've always had this retention problem retaining the mm -hmm. language and there's also like a um there's an interest level problem mm -hmm. in the languages so uh, on the one hand, that can be kind of discouraging. <laughs> um, I think for me, I still believe it has the same value that it always has. Mm. So looking at it differently, mm -hmm. uh, you're, I guess there's an even, there will be an even, even greater need for it, whether everyone, um, whether a lot of people see that need or not, because if fewer, fewer people are learning it, well, if we want to stay rooted in the text, uh, we're going to need a critical mass of people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and for keeping texts updated uh, with the modern language, right? So just as English is always growing, I'm sure Mandarin is always growing and changing. And so 
we need people that are on translation teams that know the languages to help do that. So yeah, it yeah. we have to continue a critical mass at least. Yeah. Um, in Mandarin, do y'all have Hebrew grammars available to you? We do. We okay. do. There's not as many, but there's probably more than some other non-English languages. That's good. So we've got we've got a few. Um, like, are they the more popular ones? Yeah. Are they more inductive or deductive? Or we've some... still got we've still got more of the traditional ones. Uh, so deductive. every time that I've taught um, Hebrew grammar and mm -hmm. Mandarin, I've used Pratico and Van Pelt. Um, Interesting. So, yeah. So what are your students reading from? Because I, I assume they can't read English as you do. It's translated. So there's a Chinese translation of Pratico Van Pelt. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. Maybe I need to get you to do a translation of our book. <laughs> <laughs> if only my Mandarin were that good. <laughs> I didn't realize that Zondervan had done a uh, uh, a Mandarin translation. Um, it's not done by Zondervan. <clears throat> oh. Right. I guess they signed the um, a release to somebody to translate it then. Yes. Kind of like a lot of the German works sign off to Americans to translate. Yes. Mm. A lot of Chinese theological works that have been translated from English are put out by Chinese publishers. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm I am maybe I need to talk to one of those publishers and say, hey, here's a new method instead of the other guys. So um Okay, so what do you recommend to your students who have sat under you for one semester of Hebrew? As you said, they most of the time only take one. What do you recommend to them to retain their Hebrew or even continue growing in their Hebrew? Well, for them, I guess I didn't, uh, I should supplement my previous answer. For those students, I would encourage them to take the full year of ah. Hebrew and of Greek. Sure. Um, uh, that the MBS students and MDiv students um, would often take. Okay. And to keep it up, there are different things that uh, I've been trying. So mm -hmm. uh, in the summers, uh, and this is only the second summer, but we will we have a Zoom uh, reading group in which we alternate weeks reading um, Greek and Hebrew. Um, so that's uh that's one way and it as you know there's more and more good resources out there that mm -hmm. give you hebrew and greek um, exposure and practice um yeah uh, in small bites whether it's daily dose or it's like devotionals you know mm -hmm. that use hebrew, greek um stuff like that mm -hmm. so i encourage them um to make use of those and i feel like as a teacher i have to try to show them while they're taking Hebrew grammar, that this can actually be useful and sure. enjoyable to you. And that's yeah. worth <laughs> um, keeping up or picking back up after yeah. your courses. Agreed. Um, one of the things that I've uh, gotten a hold of, and I was telling Ron, the, the African-American Hebrew scholar last week, um, one of the books that I require of my students is called Exegetical Gems, uh, Hebrew Exegetical Gems. And I think there's a Greek version of that as well. Um, and so as I lecture through the different grammar aspects of the language, they then have to go and read the respective chapter from Exegetical Gems that gives you that hermeneutical and theological, why does it matter? Um, so why does a weak verb matter? Why does a uh, past... I don't know why. Why does a a a pl matter? And it, it and it really does a very good job of highlighting to them like, hey, you're not just learning a language; you actually get more color to the story. It doesn't change the story. And I and I think you're agreeing with me. And and everybody that I've talked to says, you know, if you know Greek and Hebrew, that's great. It doesn't change the story. Um, it just adds color to the story that is oftentimes lacking. So yeah, I. I agree. If they can get hands on more resources that do that, and I don't know if Mandarin has those or not, and it's great to hear that there's companies translating them. Um, maybe those would be resources to point your students to. Um, and Asians tend to have better apps on uh, cell phones and things of that sort. Um, and so in English, there's several interlinear 
English Hebrew apps. And so I, I prescribe those to my students and say, look, whenever you go to church, if your preacher says, hey, turn into, I don't know, Psalm 90, like I just preached this past Sunday, um, open up your interlinear app and have it with your English Bible and try reading the Hebrew. And if you don't know the word, look down to the English word, but stick reading to the Hebrew. Do y'all have apps as such in Mandarin available? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll ask my students. I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if there is. I think something like that would be really super helpful um, for them to have on hand. So that way, whenever they're in chapel or whatever with you and they have their Mandarin Bible and paper, they can also have the Hebrew or the Greek open um, <clears throat> and trying their best through it. Um, yeah, I come to think of it, I think there's a way because um, Logos, yeah. the software, um, there's like a there's like a Chinese version of it that's that Logos runs. Awesome. And so yeah, if you can open up your Logos app, yeah, and you have some original language capability, then yeah, you know you can you can do that. Yeah, Logos has, of course, their print house is called Lexum. Um, Logos has the Lexum interlinear Bible um, on their apps, and one of the things, and since you noted this one, I'll tell you one of the cool things about the Lexum interlinear app is that um, if you click on the cog, the the um, preferences or whatever it's called. Yeah. You can change the level of, of English or, or heart language that it shows. So you can click down and you can say, hide any word that is utilized more than 40 times. Well, you just instantaneously turned your app into being a reader Hebrew Bible. So I don't know, that might be something for you to look at with your students and um, try to help them while they're in chapel, when they go to church uh, for their daily Bible study. Um, mm -hmm. That might be kind of fun. So. Well, uh, last question, and since you are a cell hammer student and you will put us all to shame, I am certain, and you read and teach from your Hebrew Bible, uh, what is your favorite passage in Hebrew to read aloud? I was thinking about this one before the video, and it's so hard to choose. Yeah. Because there's, there's when a... it's three quarters of the Bible, right? I know. I know. I was... I was wondering, I can give you one, but I was wondering if I'd be allowed to pick one that that I'm just really fascinated by right now and thinking about a lot, and I can tell you why. Yeah, no, uh, Ron last okay? week picked one that he's currently fighting through in Esther, so I love it. Okay, thanks for giving me a little leeway on the question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, so mine um, comes from Genesis 22, oh. and it's verse 8. So this classic oh. passage, Abraham gets commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac yeah. as a birth offering and um, I'm just captivated mm. by the dialogue between Isaac and Abraham in verses seven and eight mm. so I'll so that I don't have to read the whole thing I'll just pick it up in the second half of verse seven okay where Isaac is going to ask the question it's really this question that I've I'm just riveted by. Yeah. This is Isaac saying, Vayomer hine ha esh vaha etsim. Vaaye hase la ola. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. And where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Yeah. So I am just riveted by this. Um, question, and I'll just give you a little bit of background why perhaps um, a lot of people are already familiar with the question. Mm. But the first time um, I read this question, and really commentaries too, um, the natural interpretation of it is this is Isaac. Um, he's just this innocent boy, mm -hmm. and he doesn't even know that he's about to be sacrificed. Mm. And he's just unwittingly asking this horrifying question because actually he's the one that's supposed to be sacrificed. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, I mean, that's, I think that's what, that's a big part of what this question um, means. But when I, when I read the rest of this chapter mm. or the next seven or eight verses, his question, it kicks this entire domino effect um, 
in, uh, uh, in, uh, it caused this whole domino effect because then in the next verse, his father Abraham says that God will provide or choose mm -hmm. or see for himself Hase la Ola, the lamb mm. for offering. And then you get these other questions like, is Abraham just like trying to dismiss Isaac or whatever? Right. Is this a real answer? Is that even true? But then you keep reading more and then it actually happens like mm. that. Or at least Abraham gets stopped by an angel and says, don't mm -hmm. sacrifice Isaac. <clears throat> and, and then in verse 13, Abraham lifts up his eyes and sees and there's a ram, Isle, caught by its horns in some kind of bush yeah. yeah whatever that word means um but and then he sacrifices that um ram instead of his son tahat bano mm -hmm. so to me when i go back and it makes me rethink and reread isaac's um question as though it's not just this innocent question from this unwitting boy who's about to get sacrificed as a burnt offering mm. but it actually is a it's an important question and it's a central question to the meaning of the whole passage yeah here is that lamb and and i think you just i think we have to wrestle with the passage to uh, uh to figure that out yeah and i think if you go back to the 25 right at uh, the end of 25 uh when the shot uh so the we will go and worship and we will come back right um it it kind of opens up the door for his question in seven right like or sorry six right uh no seven is the question um you know you said we're gonna go worship and come back so what are we going to worship with? <laughs> right. Um, and I, I tend to wonder, here's an interesting theological question. Um, do you think Abraham believed in resurrection based off of verse five? Or did you think that um, Abraham was, was assured that there would be a lamb at some point? I, I mean, in Hebrews 11, it, it, it pretty much says that he did um, believe in the resurrection. But even yeah. if we were to limit ourselves to Genesis 22, right. um, it doesn't ex say it explicitly, but my inclination is that I think he does believe that the Abrahamic covenant and promises will still be fulfilled through Isaac, Good. even if he has to sacrifice him as a burnt yeah. offer. So yeah. um I, I don't think he knows how everything is going to play out, but personally, I don't think that he's just saying, okay, well, I'll, okay, I'll sacrifice Isaac. And I guess the covenant's gone. I don't think he's doing that. Hmm. Um, because, you know, later on that the angel com uh, commends him so much. Mm -hmm. And I would see this as more of a triumph of Abraham's faith rather mm -hmm. than kind of a stumble as he's had before sometimes. No, I, I completely agree. So, um, and I know you do some of this work and uh, in the book that I see over your right shoulder back there. So give a plug for your own book <laughs> of uh, Christ in the Pentateuch. Thanks. Uh, that's, actually, that's actually just a framed oh, okay. um, cover, but this is the real thing. So yeah. the Messianic vision of the Pentateuch. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, published by IVP in 2019. Yeah, it's a good work. It's about 300 pages. <clears throat> yeah. Um, of the books that I've handled in regards to Messiah or Jesus in the Pentateuch, I think yours is the uh, my my favorite, the one that I recommend the most. So okay. others uh, come lacking and seem too Jewish, in my opinion, um, because they're trying to tiptoe around offending rabbis. Whereas you theologically lay down the gauntlet and say, no, it's, it's, we need Jesus here. So I appreciated that. Thank you. Well, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up right here. Thanks. We talked about Chinese and Hebrew and retention and some Hebrew in Genesis 22 for us to read and think on today. So uh, we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much, Kevin, for uh, joining me. And best of uh, future wishes for your endeavors in learning to teach Hebrew in your second language, Mandarin. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, Mario. Thanks for having me on. It was fun to talk and look forward to seeing you again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now.